You can always tell when it's a novice writer or a writer and an artist who are in bad relation because there will be blocks of text everywhere explaining the picture, explaining how the character is feeling. You know, deep in her heart, she knew her son would never return from battle, so she shed a single tear. When you could just draw a picture of her looking at a picture of her son with a tear rolling down her street, you, you know, like people trying to write it like a book versus show it like a movie. And there's a delicate balance to be struck, and it's the same with code. I think it helps to think almost as though you were storyboarding your work. If you were writing a talk, how you would block it. Here is a frame, you know, a single panel of content, and it must be self-contained. What is the picture doing? What is it that needs to be explained that cannot be inferred from looking at the thing itself? Actually, for React, we did not invite the Link community in. Mm -hmm. We only worked with a few selected people like Sylvia, the Code Sandbox team, a couple of people helping us build the site, one design director. It was a very small group. I mostly, during that side, like after the writing, I took over project management to ensure that it would actually reach fruition. Welcome to the API The Docs podcast. My name is Laura Vash, and I will be the host today. In 2023, two nominees received the Best New Developer Experience Innovation Award at the DevPortal Awards, the React.dev portal and the Miro Developer Platform. Both portals presented similarly innovative solutions, for which interactive code samples with different audiences and goals, each deserving recognition for the outstanding level of execution and integration with their docs. And then, the React.dev portal also received the recognition as the best enterprise-level developer portal of the year 2023. My guest today is Rachel Lee Navors, who was, together with Don Abramov, the elemental center of the creation of this portal. And we will be talking about how the React.dev portal was made, then about the many stakeholders of developer portals, and advice against zombie key results will also surface. Warmest welcome to the API The Docs podcast. And my guest today is Rachel Lina Bors, and I'm very, very, very happy that you're here and that we could pull this off. Hi, welcome. Hello, thank you so much for having me today. It's good to be here, Laura. And you're calling in from London, so we're not too far from each other. And this has been in the cooking to talk ever since the React the Dev Portal won the Dev Portal Awards last December. So this is really great. Uh, very exciting. To be fair, I think that the, uh, the the dev portal was tied, was it not? Uh, there was another uh, champion. Yes, absolutely. Um, the best new DX innovation winner was both React.dev and also Miro. Wonderful. Uh, I just uh, want to give a little hat tip out there. But yes, uh, it's good to be back. Uh, very exciting for the team and the people who worked on the on the dev portal with me. I, I We couldn't be more delighted and pleased. It's been wonderful to get to know all the other teams that have been building these uh, these fabulous developer portals. It's a, an art and a, obviously a work of love for so many. A lot, a lot, a lot of people know you as... Um... Uh, leading the React and the React Native Developer Portal efforts at Meta mm -hmm. to teach the world to think in React. But uh, where else would they know you from? Well, before my time working on the React core team at Meta, I also briefly did a stint at Microsoft working on the Edge browser, as well as I've worked at AWS. But before all of that, I was a largely open source contributor to MDN, Mozilla Developer Network, perhaps the, the documentation for how to use the web and all its native APIs and wonders. And I also worked with the W3C on the web animation API. I made lots of cool creative demos, largely informed from my past as an award-winning cartoonist. So I've had a very storied life, gone from open source, gone to, gone to fang companies, and also some, some startups littered about here and there. I've been everywhere inside the web community. Can you go back a little bit about that cartoonist part? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so I was raised on a farm in the middle of nowhere, Virginia. And I, we, I, I argued long and hard with my mother to get a, an internet connection. And I drew comics. I was inspired by Japanese cartoons like Sailor Moon. 
and I drew comics for teenage girls, and I shared them over the internet with teenage girls, and eventually ended up having a weekly comic with 400,000 readers around the world, and it won a couple of awards too. I like winning awards, apparently. This is like, you know, if you didn't win an award for it, did it really happen? It seems to be my, my life's motto. But yeah, I was a cartoonist, but unfortunately, even being an award-winning cartoonist in the United States can't buy you the health care that you need. So I moved into doing web development because I had to build a websites and such to host the comics. I was pretty good at that. And it turns out that is something that you can earn enough to get health care with. So that's how my, my career forked the first time. Do you still draw? People ask me that, but very rarely. I'm too busy to draw most of the times now. I did draw a little bit for the React Dev Portal. You can still see some of my illustrations in it and with React Native as well. But to be honest, drawing is not a full-time occupation. It's more of doodling is something I do during meetings or on vacation these days. It's not alien to you that drawings can sometimes bring a concept faster than a lot of words, which have very specific meanings to a lot of people. And then add code to that. So how are you now thinking about showing versus telling how code works? So one thing, I, I love engineers and I love how much they... They love to share when they want to. Um, I've worked with many who write what I call code essays. They're long blog posts that detail exactly how the code is working. But one of the challenges is that I'm, I'm actually not a very clever person. I'm not a very patient person, at least. I struggle to finish these essays. And that has been the reason that I'm, you know, you know perhaps not the most well-versed in every API in the world. I, it takes me a long time to read. So... I'm always looking for ways to sum things up, to get the same point across in fewer words, to leverage mental models the reader already has with metaphors, to help them get to an understanding faster. And bulk of content that I edit in, in my career you know, has been things like specs, which are very detailed, but and explain exactly how something works, but not why and when you might use it, nor how you can think about it working so that you better understand it without having to eat the entire specification. And that goes back to my cartooning roots. Back in comics, you could always tell in comics, typically in America, the writer and the artist are two different people. Now, this has changed with web comics and independent comics. And in Japan, usually the writer and the artist are the same person. But in the United States, there's the writer and there's the artist. Neil Gaiman is a writer. He doesn't draw his comics. He's actually in the UK. And you can always tell when it's a novice writer or a writer and an artist who are in bad relation because there will be blocks of text everywhere explaining the picture, explaining how the character is feeling. You know, deep in her heart, she knew her son would never return from battle, so she shed a single tear when you could just draw a picture of her looking at a picture of her son with a tear rolling down her street you know like people trying to write it like a book versus show it like a movie and there's a delicate balance to be struck and it's the same with code you could write a long essay detailing what the code is doing with little blocks of code thrown in if you're lucky which most of the times turns into entire files pages dropped in or you can guide people through how they can think about it and this can be done both verbally you know you can you can write it out you can show it i did lots of doodles to help people understand how React worked. But there's also things like scrolly telling. I'm working on a project called Code Hike with a friend of mine. He's the author of Code Hike. It's this open source little library. And if you remember how Stripe's documentation or perhaps Swift UI, they have it so that as you scroll through the documentation, as different things are being edited and the text walks you through what's happening, the code changes. So it's almost like two panes. You've got text describing what's happening on one side and the code uh, actually swapping out on the other side. And I did a lot of research with animation. And what I love is that this is a demonstrative kind of animation where the code changes to show you, to draw your attention to the change. It's very different from looking at one block of code and looking at another block of code and trying to guess how they've changed and reading the text to make sure you've understood it. That's a very long, complex process when you could just read and watch at the same time. I think this is why uh, videos have become so popular recently when it comes to explaining code, because you do get the benefit of seeing the changes and someone verbally walking you through it. Text is capable of this. It's just a little bit more complicated. Text is also much easier to maintain than a video, which is why I'm most invested in projects like Code Hike, which kind of um, 
make it easy for anybody to demonstrate how the code is changing in their walkthroughs as opposed to making these long code essays. This is a technical implementation difference or does it require a mindset difference from the writer? Ooh, a very good question. Part of it is mindset. And when I was younger, I used to believe that you you had to think right, you, you had to change how you approach things. But as I've gotten older, I've seen how pretty much anybody who implements something like Code Hike, once you get the tool, most people adopt how they think to work with the tool. Whereas before the tool existed, people had to adapt how they felt. I almost think using something like Code Hike forces people to think in terms of showing versus telling. Because now, to restate the obvious, would make the, make the experience look less appealing. So people lean a little bit more on the tool. That said, I do think that, say for some reason, you're not able to implement Code Hike. I understand it can be hard to get engineering resources. I think it helps to think almost as though you were storyboarding your work. If you were writing a talk, how you would block it. Here is a frame, you know, a single panel of content, and it must be self-contained. What is the picture doing? What is it that needs to be explained that cannot be inferred from looking at the thing itself? You know, when you see the woman looking at a picture of a man, do you need to explain, you know, this is her son? So think about what is missing from each chunk, each, each segment that might not be apparent to the reader that you might have to tell versus show, and what is the obvious that can be extracted? What are the reasons why the React portal, of which you were part of the making, got the Grand Award uh, with a really loud cheer from the jurors was the, the way everything has been rounded off along the user journey. It doesn't fall down left or right. There's a very clear way to learn through that site. And the way you were talking now, that reminded me of that. Was this way of thinking also there with you? when this portal was created? Actually, how was this made? Who, who made it? And, <laughs> and what were the circumstances that, that allowed for such? I wanted to join the React team because I couldn't understand how React worked. Everybody was learning React. And every time I tried to learn it, I got frustrated during the environment setup steps. It didn't matter if I was using their documentation or taking a fancy expensive course, I would get lost in the weeds and feel very sad about it. And it made me feel like I wasn't very clever. And this is a terrible feeling for a developer to have just because of the, uh, the learning materials. And the question was, is this a problem with React or is this a problem with the educational materials? The opportunity arose for me to join the React team to help them with, well, I was too scared to join Meta as an engineer because I felt really poorly about my engineering skills. But they were like, well, we need somebody who can teach and take care of our documentation sites. Why don't you do that? Looks like you've written a book and you've worked at MDN as a tech writer. Why don't you do that? So I did. And I thought, well, I will learn React from the people who know it the best. And I got to team up on the React site itself with Dan Abramoff, who is a very good patient engineer and he's quite clever and explains react pretty darn well but he also writes long code essays he has his own blog over reacted where he'd been thinking about how to explain react for a long time so when i got there he was pretty good at explaining it to me and i thought well i don't have to learn react and explain it all myself i just have to help him use his words better so i used all the skills i've learned from well, information architecture and authoring books and comics to help lay out the learning path for React. We workshopped the information architecture, figuring out all the little bits that needed. And we had this grand spreadsheet covering each step of the way. Now, looking back, I wish that we hadn't made it such a linear course because people don't learn linearly. But this was the vision. Uh, the React team really believed that people needed to go from from zero to one with React, had to be guided down this path to give them all the aha moments. And my job was to make that happen. I also worked on the user interface. I did a lot of uh, project management with our collaborators at Code Sandbox to create interactive sandboxes. This allowed us to remove a lot of explanation. You could remove the explanations and, you know, if, you know, environment setup and all the fluff and just get it down to, Try this thing and see how it breaks. And people would try it. And then next paragraph, okay, here's how you can do it without breaking it. 
You do it, it's unbroken. Next paragraph, here's what happened there. And this was how Dan and I moved through the content. Dan would write a first draft, and I'd bring my editorial chainsaw through, and I'd change it. And then he'd make changes, and I'd make changes. And then I'd draw a little picture. I'd be like, Dan, is this how it's working? Dan would be like, no. And other pictures, is this how it's working? OK. Uh, and that is how we worked through it. It was like writing a book. It was like writing a book and also building the, the website for the book. If I had to go back and do it again, probably would have spent less time building a new website, more time on just getting through the content. But the new website did allow us to do things like add the sewing boxes and create a better flow using Markdown. Um, and the build process was faster so we could make edits and see them live and working together much better. There were many people who contributed as well. We had community contributors making the edit, uh, the, the examples better. We were originally just using cats and uh, it got a bit tiring. So Sylvia Vargas came in and redid all of the examples using, um, I wanted them to be diverse and inclusive, you know, universally interesting, not just Star Wars references, which is culturally inappropriate. That's us exporting Disney IP to the world. No, 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 no. So using things that humans everywhere could identify with, like the scientists who changed our land, culinary cuisine, cities around the world, you know, universal human IP so that everybody, intellectual property, so that everybody could relate to the docs and see themselves reflected there. But it was an effort. It was mostly Dan and I working during the pandemic on this. I like to say this is how we spent our pandemic. But we had great collaborators from the Sandbox company, from the React community, and contributions from them as well. So the overall design in the end, it was mostly our brainchild, but I, I must also acknowledge that it was so much better for the help that we got from our collaborators than anything that we could have done alone. How did that practically work? Two people getting help from a large, large, large community. How did that not end up with you being flooded in communications and opinions? How did you do that? Actually, for React, we did not invite the community in. Mm -hmm. We only worked with a few selected people like Sylvia, the Code Sandbox team, a couple of people helping us build the site, one design director. It was a very small group. I mostly, during that side, like after the writing, I took over project management to ensure that it would actually reach fruition. It was React Native where I really invited the whole community and That was the project that I worked on before React, where a lot of these ideas were trialed, for instance, the sandboxes, worked on those with a collaborator in the community, a company called Expo. They had built sandboxes that allowed people to see their changes in a mobile environment. Pretty tough, uh, but it was great to have them offer that technology. So we could really see how those, those initial um, user interface improvements improved how people were learning and using the portal. And I did engage mostly in program management. I worked through GitHub and Twitter. I'd go on Twitter, I'd go on our Discord and say, hello, React Native community. We are doing a big update. I need your help. Can you take these examples for all these pages and put them into a sandbox? And people would grab the issue and they complete it. And I'd check in every morning and I'd merge things into the code base and I'd, you know, check it off of the checklist. And it was all managed through GitHub and our community resources. So for React Native, I was tapping the community. But for React, it was more of a core team uh, and a meta project. We had contractors, we had a few select uh, collaborators, and there was a bit of program and project management towards the end. Uh, but for the most part, our open source collaboration tools and the markdown that we used made it possible for everyone to contribute. And most of the coordination could be done as we do in open source through GitHub and community communication tools. And would you do something differently now? Oh, of course. Um, let's see, for the React project, the first advice I got to give you is you may come into a, a new doc space, a new portal, and your engineers might say, the first thing we have to do is we've got to install a new framework, content management system. Uh, oh, we don't like that it's using this language. We all use this other language, so let's make it use this language instead. Your content problems are very, very rarely a stack problem. Engineers are used to seeing the stack as being an issue. And there's this 
bias that if we just switch to a different platform, that will solve our problems. And the problem is actually that people don't like the content and the content needs to be addressed. So I would say spend less time worrying about your platform, more time worrying about your content. And if anyone pushes on, oh, we got to solve the platform first, I've seen it many times and uh, a couple of my projects have gone through this as well. I would say, unless you like spending six months and having a changing of the guard and then spending perhaps another six months changing the platform again, you should not spend energy on that. There's far more useful things for you all to spend energy on. The best way to analyze whether or not changing the actual, uh, the, the way the, the developer portal is hosted is if it allows for easier collaboration with engineers. I once joined a company where, you know, everything was hosted in a CMS that the engineers couldn't access. And once they moved to a markdown file system and a new platform, the engineers were able to contribute through GitHub and it increased their contributions. That's a reasonable reason for letting go of one framework and moving, doing a migration. Or if it increases your velocity substantially, if you're able to ship improvements to the documentation or your portal faster through this. And lastly, the third reason why you might change platforms is if there is a UI improvement that is simply not possible with the thing that you're building on. Perhaps you're using something out of the box or a service and you want to use a cutting edge open sandbox solution. That just won't work because I don't know, it only has React uh, components available and your documentation site is a view site. And you really got to switch to React so that you can have access to those UI modules that make such a difference in the user experience. Those are the only three reasons, UI, velocity, and collaboration. So if you can't point to how the migration is going to improve one of those three things, probably don't need to do it. And that was uh, the thing that I learned because we did start with the migration on the, the React documentation, but I think we could have started with actually just updating the content and the community would have seen immediate impact from that. I always try to bias on giving community immediate impact but the React team really loves to go for perfection. And that's what we aimed for with this. I mean, it won us an award, can't knock it. But I have to say that is the thing that I would do differently is I try to release the content we were working on more regularly in a place where more people could find it because spinning out on the framework was not putting the community first. Putting the community first would have been sharing the content quicker, faster, and more regularly and worrying less about how it looked. So at this point, we arrived to about halfway into our conversation with Rachel. And while editing, I decided to cut this into two because it's just too long for one listen. I welcome you to listen to part two, where we are going to be continuing about objectives, key results, and key performance indicators that as relevant to developer portals, how can things go wrong and how can things go right? Thank you for listening and see you at part two. Thank you for listening to the API The Docs podcast. We thank our colleagues at Pronovis Developer Portals for letting us work on this and the entire API community for all of the mutual support and sharing of experiences that you give each other. Do you have a topic or guest that you would like us to spotlight? Drop a note at podcast at pronovix.com. If you go to the website api.docs.org, you can find the recaps and recordings of past API.docs conferences as well as the upcoming program. Until next time, be well.